Today on Joe's Geek Show, we're going to be talking about the one shot, Are You Afraid of Dark Side? What's going on and welcome to Joe's Geek Show, the video series where we talk comics. And before we get started, if you're new and like supports the channel, you can do so by hitting that like button, clicking that subscribe button, and sharing. And with that, well, the scariest thing about this book is its price tag. And the first story titled Are You Afraid of Dark Side is written by Elliot Callan with art by Mike Norton, colors by Alan Pasalacqua, and letters by Simon Boland. The second story Bloody Mary is written by Kenny Porter with art by Max Dunbar, colors by Louis Guerrero, and letters by Becca Carey. The third story Backseat Killer is written by Calvin Kasolke, art by Rob Guillory, Colors by Louis Guerrero, and letters by Simon Boland. The fourth story titled Escape the Dark Fortress is written by Dave Wildgoes, art by Pablo M. Collar, colors by Will Quintana, and letters by Dave Sharp. The fifth story, The Endless Staircase, is written by Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing, art by Jesus Hervaz, colors by Eva De La Cruz, and letters by Clem Robbins. The sixth story titled The Ogo Pogo is written by Ed Brisson. Art by Christopher Mitten, colors by Tony Avina, and letters by Becca Carey. The seventh story, titled Black Eyed Kids, is written by Terry Blass, with art by Gary Brown, colors by Marissa Louise, and letters by Dave Sharp. The eighth story, titled The Seller, is written by Jeremy Hahn, with pencils by Tony Atkins, inks and colors by Moritat and letters by ALW's Troy Pateri. So this book starts off with the Teen Titans on a camping trip when Amiko, aka Red Arrow, begins a series of campfire stories with hers focusing on Harley Quinn and Darkseid titled Bloody Mary. In this, a group of kids enter an old hotel in search of the fabled Bloody Mary when they run into Harley Quinn, also searching for Mary. Here they run into Darkseid who shares that Bloody Mary was once one of his furies who got trapped in the mirror dimension, now only able to get out when summoned. They are all then attacked by Bloody Mary, who manages to snatch all of the kids, and also overpower both Harley Quinn and Darkseid, until the two work together to smash the mirror, which sucks her back in. The kids are then freed, and they all part ways, ending with Mirror Master finishing up a heist and running into Bloody Mary. This leads to Robin's story titled Backseat Killer, in which Batman is giving chase to the Mad Hatter, who manages to outrun the Batmobile, once lost, Batman exits the vehicle, finding the Mad Hatter's bike before returning to the Batmobile in order to drive further up the road to see if he can find the Hatter. It's then Batman comes under attack from a semi-truck, giving Alfred the license plate number to run before trying to outmaneuver the truck. However, every time Batman thinks he's in the clear, the truck manages to pop up behind him. Batman decides to make one last effort using explosives to distract the truck before leaping from the Batmobile to try and smash through the driver's window, except it completely disappears. It's then revealed that the Mad Hatter had been hiding in the Batmobile with a knife the whole time, and Batman captures him and puts him back into the vehicle. The tale ends with Alfred informing Batman that, according to the license plate, it showed that the truck, along with the driver, had died in a crash several years prior. The book then carries into a crush telling her story titled Escape the Dark Fortress, which sees Green Lantern Jon Stewart begging the Guardians to look into a living fortress when it's revealed these are not the Guardians and Jon is already inside of this fortress. As explained, the fortress is able to read the surface of a person's mind and can show them whatever they wish. The fortress attempts to break John by tearing at his friendships with the other Green Lanterns and even Katma, the love he lost. John doesn't fall for any of this and remains steeled as he discovers the heart of the fortress, which reveals its purpose is to gather energy and await his makers, the Empire of Tears, to come for him and use him to conquer everything. John informs it that the Empire died out long ago and the fortress decides it should just wreak havoc, ending both itself and whatever is in its path. John fights against it, eventually knocking it out, and when it comes to, John reveals he powered it up with an Owen power battery, and should it choose, can instead become a hostile for Green Lanterns, which the fortress agrees. Kid Flash then steps up to the plate with his tale titled The Endless Staircase, which focuses on the Phantom Stranger and how throughout history and the multiverse appears before certain people that have accumulated knowledge they weren't supposed to have, saving certain species from complete extinction, or helping carve the path for heroes to be born. The most notable was taking Joe Chill after he shot the Waynes, so that Bruce would spend his entire life 
looking for the man, and also becoming the Batman. Aqualad afterwards takes the reins and tells not so much a story, but an adventure he shared with Aquaman titled Aquaman and Aqualad vs. The Ogopogo. This one details the aquatic duo in Canada battling a crazed creature that turns out was just trying to protect its eggs from a band of sea creatures that have a hallucinogen poison. Aqualad becomes infected with this poison and imagines Aquaman as a monster as he lets out an electromagnetic pulse. He awakens sometime later with Aquaman filling him in and hoping that in the next 500 years, someone else will be there to protect the Ogopogo and its eggs. It's at this point Crush quickly points out that Blue has not taken a turn with the story, which he decides not to tell one, thus Amiko takes another turn, telling a story called Black Eyed Kids. This one focuses on Vixen and Wonder Woman who are checking up on a nearby village where Vixen has a friend. Once they arrive, they are told of these kids with black eyes that had been coming to the huts asking for shelter, but no one knows what happens when you let them in, only that they turn violent if you don't. Just then, some of these kids appear at their door and Vixen doesn't allow them in, which the kids then turn into creatures and attack both Vixen and Wonder Woman. After a brief battle, Wonder Woman uses her lasso to get the truth, and it turns out that they are all actually animals of the land that utilize a morphogenic field around the area in order to transform. They discover that the animals are actually seeking haven from poachers, where Wonder Woman and Vixen then manage to track and find the poachers and kick them out of the area with the help of the animals. Finally inspired, Blue decides to tell his story titled The Cellar, in which Lois and Clark head to a house looking for two missing girls that Clark knows. The man who answers the door invites them in and Lois distracts him with a conversation while Clark searches the house discovering the girls tied up in the cellar. He heads down putting on his Superman attire but is then attacked by a monster woman who begins sucking Superman's life force. Lois and the man hear the commotion and the man says that's his wife and attacks Lois. With Superman too weak to fight back, it's up to Lois who discovers some kind of egg pod that was able to reanimate the man's deceased wife, but now needs to suck the life force of others in order to survive. With no other options left, Lois smashes it over the guy's head, and once destroyed, the monster woman disappears, which then cuts to Lois and Clark watching the police round up the bodies and seeing the girls are taken care of. The story ends with Lois and Clark taking their leave, when we see, not too far off, more of those egg pods. Blue is commended on his story, and Robin declares that the camping trip is a success, when the other Teen Titans point and look at the grotesque monster behind Robin. And like an anthology, the stories can be hit and miss. One thing to note is that this book is not meant to be taking all that serious as some characters act a little, well, out of character. Particularly Robin because from the dialogue and the costume design, it's clear this is meant to be the Damian Wayne version of the character who's generally a little more brooding and snarky and kind of got that, you know, stiff upper lip and, you know, kind of turns his nose up at people. Whereas here, characterizations are more akin to, say, Teen Titans Go. I mean, Damien definitely smiles a little more in here and actually makes assertions that, you know, we're a team, we're a family, and not his typical usual loner self. But it is kind of interesting to watch all of the Teen Titans get together around this campfire to give their best Midnight Society impressions. And that's one thing I actually wish this book had was before each of their stories, I wish they would have just like thrown that little dust powder or whatever on, on the campfire that would make it go like whoosh. The title of the book is already on the nose. You might as well go the whole mile. But how were the stories in this book? Well, when it comes to the first one, I thought it was just dumb fun. I mean, you got kids, you got Harley Quinn, they're both tracking down Bloody Mary, and it turns out Bloody Mary is real. Then we get Darkseid coming in saying, yeah, yeah, Bloody Mary is definitely real. She used to be one of my theories till she got trapped in the mirror verse with this experimental mother box. And the book says that basically the reason Darkseid is here and wants to kill Bloody Mary is that she holds some kind of a grudge against him, which is Definitely interesting considering that Darkseid usually views most everybody that's not him as, well, beneath him and considering how long she's apparently been trapped in the mirrorverse and stuff, 
I, I don't see why he would attempt to go after her. I mean, of course, it will also her being in the mirror verse and the whole say her name three times in the mirror, she shows up. I don't know why he just couldn't have done that on Apocalypse, but still makes more sense than the time that he teamed up with the Joker in order to help Donald Trump win the presidency. And also given the context of the story, I'm also kind of surprised that Mirror Master has never encountered Bloody Mary before. Because again, she's been trapped in the Mirrorverse for apparently a really long time. I mean, long enough to become a legend on Earth. So I guess it's kind of weird that this would be his first encounter. When it comes to the second story, I thought this one was actually fairly weak. It's just Batman chasing the Mad Hatter and then he fights a ghost semi-truck and turns out, ah, the Mad Hatter was in the Batmobile the whole time with a knife. And I guess they made the potential assertion that the truck was trying to get Batman out of the vehicle and was maybe trying to save him. I'm not really sure. And then I do have to wonder if this ghost truck, like, always appears on the road. Like, if there's just like a random family driving down the road and this ghost truck just comes out of nowhere and just starts, you know, joyriding everybody. But it's it's an anthology book. We're never going to get that. Now, the Jon Stewart story was the first one in the entire set so far that I actually enjoyed because I can actually see this also playing out in a Green Lantern book. It definitely feels like a consistent story with Jon Stewart. You get some good insight to his character and also how he views his teammates. I also wouldn't mind seeing that whole live fortress brain thing come into play in the actual Green Lantern book. Kid Flash's story is also pretty decent, I'd say the most artistic out of all of them, with these tales of the Phantom Stranger taking these people up his stairs. And there was the one page where I kind of chuckled a little bit, where the Phantom Stranger actually went after a comic book artist who was drawing, you know, the Phantom Stranger, as well as you saw on the back wall what looked like it was supposed to be a Batman Death in the Family cover. At least to me, that's what it looked like. There wasn't really enough detail to really tell, but it you know, looked like Batman was like holding a body. And then adding in that sort of revelation that the Phantom Stranger took Joe Chill away after he shot Bruce's parents, therefore putting Bruce on the path to become a Batman, was a pretty interesting addition. I mean, by now there's been a few stories where Batman has managed to track down Joe Chill and confront him. But it is interesting when you have a world where that has never happened. Batman will forever be searching for that man. The Aquaman Aqualad story was pretty simplistic, but also like the Green Lantern story, did kind of make me think this is you know something that would happen in an Aquaman book. Even though they only referred to the creature as Ogopogo, we all know what it really was. That was that damn Loch Ness monster. I mean, was it truly attacking, or did it just need tree fitting? But it was kind of cool watching Aquaman and Aqualad step up to defend the creature against this onslaught of other creatures that I guess only come out of the woodwork every 500 years to try and eat Nessie's eggs. Because the Loch Ness Monster apparently only lays eggs once every 500 years, and if any of those eggs don't make it, that's pretty much the end of the species. And after seeing a tiny little Loch Ness Monster hatch from the egg, I do kind of hope in 500 years the next Aquaman and Aqualad will be there to defend him. The legend must live. When it came to the Wonder Woman and Vixen story, it started off okay, I thought. I like the horror design of the creatures and the entire setup with them coming to these villages and just knocking on the door saying, let us in, and then just bad stuff happens if you don't let them in. Then again, bad stuff probably happened if you did let them in. We never really found out. But when we hit that twist where it turned out they were just regular animals that were able to morph off the land and stuff like that, and the real monsters were the poachers, aka man, I'll admit that was a bit disappointing. Because I think when we have the trope of us being the real villain and the monsters just misunderstood, is a trope that, when done well, is actually pretty good. But here in this book, there was no real build up or lead into it, so it just felt kind of cheap. I didn't really expect it because there was no inkling that that's what the twist was. I think if we had had some clues within the first few panels, it may have sat a little better. 
And the last story I think is kind of in the middle ground because on one hand, Superman does look pretty weak in this story. And I also do note that the villain really does feel like Discount Parasite. But the mystery surrounding these egg pods that apparently can reanimate corpses, I mean, not full reanimation, but it sounds like they just sort of absorb the corpse's essence and they're able to like kind of project a ghostly apparition of them. That in and itself sounds like a really cool concept. And I do kind of wish we had a story where we were focusing potentially in on the origin of those egg pods, which like some other things being an anthology, it's probably never gonna come up again. And the artwork in this book I thought was pretty decent in typical anthology fashion. Each story showcases a different art style to reflect the type of story that it's trying to tell. For me personally, the Phantom Stranger art in this book is my favorite, while the Batman one is my least favorite as it's just kind of got this weird cartoony look to it. And if I'm being honest, the Batman story overall is just my least favorite in this book. It just feels so plain in comparison to the ideas with the other ones. So overall, it's got some pros, it's got some cons. Some I think hit exactly where they needed to, while others had the right idea but just kind of missed the mark. And I can say is about a middle of the road experience, which I think does make the price point on this book a little bit hefty and I personally don't think it's worth it. And with that, I'm gonna score, are you afraid of Dark Side one shot? A 6.5 out of 10. So are you afraid of Dark Side? What did you think about this book? If you've read it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please leave your comments in the comment section below. And if you liked this video, I'd love it if you'd smash that like button, share it with some friends, subscribe if you're not subscribed already, and ring that notification bell for more comic book content. And if you're wondering what to watch next, consider one of these two videos. Alright, take care, have a great day, and as always, stay geeky.